and welcome to the Winning Mentality podcast. I'm Charlie Bosco. Today's guest is Petr Koron, someone you are unlikely to have heard of, but who has a world-class attitude to life. He's followed a long and winding road to get to where he is now, but as he tells us, it's funny how the destination never quite arrives. We humans are always striving to be more, bigger, better than we currently are. Petr tells us how he started out in sport, not that he had much choice in it, as you'll soon find out, and how life led him via boxing camps in Thailand, a promising basketball career ruined by injury, and a few false starts to where he is now, running his own gym full of people he likes and who buy into his infectious passion and enthusiasm. Beautiful. Best only, only, in my, the gym. only my deadlifts. Uh, you are beautiful. <laughs> Well, you're it's more beautiful. Erase, erase. <laughs> Petr is not a decorated Olympian or a famous athlete. He's a normal guy, just like you and me. But he's one of the few people who knew what he wanted long ago and set about actually making it happen. Sometimes chatting to seemingly normal people can be as interesting as quizzing the world elite. There are some absolute gems in here from Petr, some of them amusing, such as how 90s pop star Peter Andre played his part in the story, and some of them inspiring, such as when he talks about the importance of action. He also provides one of the best phrases I've heard for a while, meet your luck halfway. When I went to chat to him in his gym in Innsbruck, Austria, in the heart of the European Alps, he was funny, engaging, warm and eloquent. Not bad for a small town kid from Slovakia speaking in his third language. So, Petr, firstly, how's my pronunciation? It's getting better. It's getting better. It's getting better. Yeah. I've been practicing for 10 minutes, but <laughs> thank you for talking to us. And you're an interesting guy. You've been involved in lots of sports. And I was amused to hear that you started your sporting career almost because you had to. You lived on top of a hill. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. We lived outside of the town. And every time I had wanted to do something with my friends, I would have to walk or bike or whatever for quite a while to get where I wanted to get to. So so what was the first sport you got into where you were doing sport to do sport, not to walk up and down the hill? <laughs> well, the first, probably as almost everybody in Europe, uh, soccer, football, yeah, because there was, there was the first thing we played with my friends. That was actually the reason I went home, changed, took my soccer ball and took off again and then in your teens i'm right in thinking you got into basketball which wouldn't seem a natural choice you're i guess six foot 180 yeah, yeah. ish centimeters uh, yeah exactly yeah oh uh, well it's not like i'm the shortest guy in europe <laughs> so that's why because the, the average players back then i mean i don't know how it's now but back then you know the average players in europe are, are weren't that tall as in, for example, in, in, in the States, in the NBA. or So the the height wasn't that much of a problem, you know. So, But I loved the sport, and so I did it. So when you were playing basketball, was this with an eye on a professional career? Were you trying to make it, or was it just for the pleasure? Well, it started as just for the pleasure, because I remember how we started with my, with my neighbor. We it was uh, Probably I was like 12 or 13 years old. I, we hung... An old basket without the bottom, we just <laughs> hung it over a garage entrance and just were trying to shoot like an old, I don't not even inflated ball <laughs> through it and whatever. So that's how it started. Uh, there was a time where it was just pleasure. And then it, as it started evolving, I was just like, there was a dream that I would probably want to play it like more seriously, take it more seriously, like professionally maybe. Definitely. It, it became, because it was a big passion of mine for a long, long time. Because people might not realize, but you can make a professional living in Europe as a basketball player. You don't have to necessarily go to the States. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, that was, what, now maybe 20 years ago. So back then, the, the situation with, the, with sports in Slovakia, you can't even compare Slovakia and States, for example, because you, you have to be really talented to somehow make it or... or make a living out of sports in Slovakia or and you probably would have to move out of the country anyway and play I don't know somewhere maybe Spain or Italy where the basketball scene was a little bit bigger it was a dream 
for a while to maybe make a living out of sports, but never really worked out. What happened when you said it didn't work out? Well, I started playing at uh, at high school. It went on. I played at the university, and then I got injured pretty seriously. I tore all the ligaments in my in my left ankle, and it took a took almost a year to heal properly. So I couldn't couldn't really walk, couldn't really jump. It was it was bad. And in that period of time, I somehow I don't want to say lost interest, but it was you know kind of done deal for me. So why is that? Is it because you weren't as good as you were? Were you nervous about how you moved on the court in case you did it again? Um, I don't know. It was it was it was at the university, and in in that period of time where I got injured, and I I kind of had some other developed some other interests like fitness for example and also university life you know how it is <laughs> party life and stuff so somehow it never i started playing again at the university but it was more like it wasn't that big of a passion anymore it was just like for fun go have have some fun and i still for a couple of months after going back on the court i still kind of felt the ankle not while playing, but afterwards. It was always kind of bothering me, and I somehow knew that that's not going to cut it, you know, the, the ankle. It was just too... didn't feel right. And so your ankle's better, but you've lost interest in basketball. And you mentioned just then you developed an interest in, in fitness, in training. Tell us how you discovered the gym, because we should point out that we're sitting in your, your own gym in Innsbruck. It began while playing basketball because uh, somewhere along the way I realized, okay, maybe I should I should use my training in the gym to get better on the court, to get better in the basketball for the fitness, for the strength, for the agility and stuff. So I, somehow, somewhere along the way, I took my training in the gym more and more seriously, and and that somehow stuck with me for for and that was the alternative when i got injured you know it's just like what i'm gonna do so i kind of i kind of run for months now so i probably i don't know so i just went to the gym and kept pumping <laughs> and what was the goal with the gym i guess initially it was rehab initially it was rehab but it was also like trying to get like this beach body physique you know that was i was just the Main reason was just to look good, you know, to be quite frankly. So, I think that's okay, though. I think a lot of people go to the gym and maybe don't admit the the real reason for going. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was kind of. I don't want to say maybe ten years ago I wouldn't tell you this like straight to your face. Ah, I always just wanted to look good. I would be like made up some excuse like no, I just want to get fit and stuff. No, it was the main reason. The main thing was just want to look better because. Maybe I had some kind of uh, issues with it because I was a small, till fifth grade in the elementary school, I was a small chubby kid. So, and I remember like watching this, it's funny, <laughs> I remember still to this day watching the video, I don't know if you know him, Peter Andre, does that name tell you something? Mysterious Girl. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I, I, don't, I don't know how to, I was going to say a classic, but that's really not true. I don't know how to describe that song, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, but, I know who Peter Andre is. But the guy, you know, I remember like a small kid watching him on the TV, I'm like, damn, you know, I was, he was in a pretty good shape, you know. And that was, that was the thing that kind of stuck in my head. And years later when I started, I don't know, it probably, that was, that was the main motivation. I don't know. But at some point it must have become a passion as oh, well. Yeah, definitely. I, w I wouldn't do it for that long if it wasn't, if it wouldn't be a passion. So it was the f maybe the main reason, but as to start, but it definitely wasn't the only reason. I, def I wanted to get fitter because of basketball back then. And then it kind of stuck, it kind of like pushed the limits and, you know, Back then, it was like this, in the 90s where I started, it was more of a bodybuilding style training. So you just like kept pushing, uh, lift more, more weights, uh, stuff, you know, the kind of different mentality than right now. But still, it was just, just pushing the boundaries to kind of, you know, be better and stronger and bigger. And So paint the picture, because Slovakia, where you come from, is not a country that a lot of people know much about. Paint the picture of the gym you go into. You, what at this stage? What did you know about training? What was the gym like? Who are the people in there? Try and paint the scene. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. This was uh, like I said. I started like at the end of the nineties, some somewhere along. It was yeah, and it was just an old underground gym somewhere down in a cellar 
it was just like more of a club gym where we would hang out with friends. Everybody knew everybody at that place. Uh, it was almost like a almost like a private gym because not everybody was allowed to go there. You couldn't you could pay the entrance fee and go and train, but not many people not too many people knew about it. And it was in my hometown. It was a small town, so not really a lot. A lot of people were into training or bodybuilding or whatever. So we were like a close community. All of my friends, like this hardcore gym, you know, like a little bit dirty and stuff. It was just like, you know, rock music playing all the time. So it, it was fun. So I spent lots of, hour, lots of hours in that gym. Even I wasn't even training. I went to the gym just to hang out, you know, just to hang out with the friend, talk, uh, talk some stuff or whatever, have make fun of people or whatever you know while training so it was it was cool yeah so that that kind of helped that whole thing as well because i felt at home with friends and stuff you know it was good atmosphere so there's already a sense of community in the gym for you which is something it seems you've continued here in innsbruck yeah so you've trained in your gym in slovakia you've decided against your professional basketball career you must be i guess by now in this stage, I guess you're in your early 20s that a lot of people are in, myself included. I think most people find themselves in this situation where you just think, what am I going to do? That's where the, the whole thing with the gym started, the, the idea or the dream about the gym. But, you know, you, you are done with the university, so then you have to get a job. You need to do something. So I went on, moved to Bratislava, which is the capital of Slovakia, because uh, for me that was the only place to move to if I want to stay in Slovakia, because I didn't want to stay in my hometown because it was just too small, you know. So even the city where my university was, there was Banska Bystrica, that's another city, like in, directly in the middle of the of the country. But it was significantly bigger than my hometown, but still too small. So the only way for me, or the, the only thing I had in my head was like, okay, now Bratislava. So I... You have to get a job. It wasn't that that difficult with your with, with my degree or or with what I was studying. So it was a big city. It is a big city, so it wasn't really a problem. But uh, yeah, so I moved to Bratislava, but still kept on training. The first thing I did, I was just like, first find a place to stay, you know, and then find a place to train. That was. <laughs> found a gym when there was like all my fr all my new friends they s quickly noticed that i was like always in the gym a lot of them actually went with me you know from time to time because they saw this this passion and they were, i don't know maybe wanted to start training as well but i don't know it was just no one really stuck with it for that long <laughs> it seems like that's quite a recurring theme actually your passion for it a lot of the gym yeah. in innsbruck seems to run off that yeah, yeah. and you've had it for a long time yeah, a really long time. Yeah, it was uh, the whole four years, the first four years in Bratislava, I was just trained. Then I started the cafe. Uh, at some point, it just didn't feel like I was doing enough. You know, it was just like you had your job for Monday to Friday. And then on the weekends, I was pretty much free, just partying with friends in Bratislava, a new city and stuff. And uh, after a while, it was just like, nah, this is not this is not right. I need to do a little bit more or do something more, something else, because I was just not feeling accomplished. And then a friend of mine was selling a, a small cafe because he had didn't have the time for it anymore. So he was like, he offered that to me. And it's like, okay, let's... So I thought about it for around two three weeks maybe and then i said okay let's do it it wasn't that much a big of a risk because uh i wasn't starting a new place from scratch i was just taking it over so how long had the cafe been running when you bought it i'm not really sure but several years so several it's an years. established business yeah 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 it was an established business and uh, i thought to myself if i'm not going to do this now i'm probably going to regret it so that's why i bought some money uh, borrowed some money from from my parents and Bought that off him and started that. So that was on the weekdays. I would work my job in Bratislava. On the weekends, I would go to the other city where my where the cafe was and uh, stay there. Work, you know, it was not not that much of a workload for me because there were waitresses and waiters that took care of all the stuff. But 
but you just need to make sure that everything was there and everything runs properly. And So how far away is the cafe from Bratislava? What's your week looking like now? You're working nine to five. What was your job in Bratislava? For IBM, like a typical desk job. Okay, so yeah. you're doing IBM nine to five, Monday yeah. to Friday. And then you're driving how far at the weekends? Uh, I, would, I would get done in the job on Friday, like at four or five, and I would hop in my car and drive a little over an hour, hour and a half, maybe, to the other city and stay there f- till Sunday night. We closed at 10 p.m. on Sunday. I would, again, get into my car, drive home, on to Bratislava, would come at like midnight, maybe, go to sleep, wake up, and go to work again. And how did your training cope with that? Uh, that wasn't big of an issue because uh, I always, on the week weekdays i would take my stuff my my sport gear with me to work right after work i would go to the gym and then i would go home but it took quite significant time to get to the gym and then go home because in Bratislava the traffic you know it's a big city so i would always come home on the on the training days i would come home at like eight maybe half past eight the evening so but on and on the weekends where i would be in the cafe I found a gym there as well, and it was I had more time there than I had in Bratislava, so that's why it wasn't that big of a problem. So you're now busy seven days a week with work and yep. training. Are you feeling a little more fulfilled by this stage? Yes, definitely, definitely. But still, at this point, there was the 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 whole training fitness thing kind of grew on me even more and more. I was back then. I was like what 24, 25, maybe. 26 around I think yeah and uh, the idea or the, the dream about my own gym was still there that's I don't really know where it started or, or how it started but it was always there and I kind of I think I was thinking about it because back at the university I would spend my summers in the states yeah uh, I would go to this family in the United States stay with them uh, it was like my second it still is like my second family and their oldest son was just as old as me. And we hung out together all the time with Chris. And uh, he was also a real good uh, athlete. He was a real good swimmer back then. And uh, we would always like talk about sport and stuff and things like that. And then when I was working uh, after the university, one day he, ro- he sent me a link with a, with a guy in, in America about his style of training. And that was the, that was the first time where I learned about CrossFit where it wasn't that really popular back then. There was, I don't, I don't know what year it was, but it, it was like eight years ago, maybe nine. I don't, I'm not sure. Chris sent me this link about, about CrossFit. I, I instantly got hooked and I uh, was like, oh, nice. This is something different because back then I was still, still kind of in this bodybuilding routine splits like chest day, arm day, leg day and stuff like that. It, it kind of was getting boring almost. It also, these functional training movements started, you know, like those workouts were kind of more fun, you know. So I started looking into it, like learning stuff, what it is, how it's, how it's actually, what's, what's the, what's the purpose, I don't want to say purpose, but what's the philosophy behind the training. And I was really fond of it. So I started training in that manner or it was, you know trying to <laughs> and uh, or in those days i think i was one of the first people to know about crossfit in in the in slovakia because i i knew a lot a lot of people from gyms and because uh, you know you build your circle of friends you know that and nobody really knew about cross no one knew what it was uh, and i was when i was doing it in regular gyms like clean and jerks and stuff like that People would look at me like, what is he doing, you know? Why is he not doing biceps? Exactly, curls? exactly. Biceps curls in squat racks. Yeah. But, but where did your knowledge come from before you found CrossFit? When you first started training your bodybuilding in the gym in Slovakia, where did your knowledge come from? How do you know to split the days? How do you know what exercises to do and reps and sets? Oh, yeah, that's quite funny as well because you remember this as well. <laughs> the era before internet. You know, back then in the 90s, early 2000 maybe, there was no internet. There was no such an overload on information like it is now. You would have to read magazines or 
just talk with friends in the gym. You know, there wasn't much of a some source of information where we go to and find everything like now. It was just what they call now bro science, but you know, this is how you started. So I'm doing it now maybe like 18, 20 years maybe going to the gym regularly. And I wouldn't even count the first five, seven years because <laughs> now when I think about what I was doing, it was just, you know, it, it wasn't complete nonsense, but it was just, uh, you know, not as effective as it could have been. I'm sure a lot of people listening to this will identify with what you just said because you look back at when you started training, you just think, I put in all those hours. Yeah. And if I just put in the same amount of effort and the same amount of hours with a bit of knowledge, definitely. I could have had so yeah. much more. But I guess it gave you, at the very least, it's given you a good base of, yeah, definitely, definitely. of, of strength. I think this, this bodybuilding training was, um, bodybuilding style of training, was a good base in terms of like your, my body got stronger, uh, the joints and everything got used to these loads and to the weight and stuff. So I gained a lot of mass in those years. I was 105 kilos when I finished university or somewhere around that time. and uh, But that was then too heavy, so I started to slim it down. But uh, yeah, it definitely gave me some base. But the, the, the sad thing about, this, about that is that when you first start with training or you're young, you're 18, 20 or whatever, you should use this time as effectively as possible because that's the time where you grow the most or or develop the most yeah and uh i wasn't doing it so to the full, full potential but now with all now what i what i know now if i could start over again it would be much better i think <laughs> and we're sitting in your gym now in innsbruck surrounded by we've got some mai tai shorts on the wall crossfit certificates when was the leap from being this guy with a job and a cafe and training at night to what you've done since? We've got, we're surrounded, we've got boxing gloves, as punch bags and all sorts of fighting equipment and <laughs> yeah. CrossFit equipment. There's all sorts in here. When was the, when was the leap yeah, from the guy yeah, with two yeah, jobs? Well, the leap was that I know exactly where it was because... Back at the first job, I remember in the lunch break, I was talking to my friends. I was like, oh, man, I need to set myself a goal that when I turn 30, I won't have to be employed anymore. So We're not talking about not working. No, no. Just not working for, for, any, somebody, for someone else. For someone else, yeah. Just working for myself or have some kind of company or whatever. And then the cafe came, yeah, so that was, uh, that was the first step. And then after four years, uh, I quit the job, the desk job, because a friend of mine offered me another job, uh, and uh, I took that because it was it was a good job. So that's why I did it. But but it was it was in a in a public sector, and uh, back then we had like uh, early elections and the government fell and every yeah, you know crazy stuff. So. Back then, we, we all had to leave the office. And uh, so that's where I quit or, you know, told my friend, hey, let's do it. Fire me because I don't want to do it because even nobody's around here. I'm not staying here. And that happened just before my 30th birthday. And I'm thinking, okay, this is kind of funny because I said maybe a third. And then it, not willingly, but it actually happened. So a <laughs> couple months before that, and I was thinking, okay, should I get another job now or what I'm going to do? And this also relates to Chris, my friend in America, because back then we used to watch these MMA videos. And in those years, it was I think it was still illegal, I think, because it was just somewhere on the internet, hidden like fights and... I remember seeing it on news, like, oh, these illegal fights and they bleeding. Like, you know, it was just back then it wasn't official. And uh, he was always telling me about these this, this boxing camps in Thailand, that he want to do it. And, and since I was always a fan of martial arts, as a small kid, I was, man, I was a ninja. You know, <laughs> like making my mom doing stuff for me like like these masks and black clothing and making my dad doing like all kinds of swords out of woods and stuff yeah, crazy stuff you know like jackie chan stuff so i was always a fan of martial arts and uh i remembered then 
just before my 30th birthday, all right, because Chris actually did it after the university. He he went on to Thailand and stayed in the camp for several weeks, I think. And then he was just writing me like, oh, man, it's so awesome and stuff. And, like, and I remember that. I'm like, okay, that would be a cool thing to do right now because I have this cafe. I don't have a job. And actually, I have lots of time. So let's do it. So it was kind of like a present to myself, a gift to myself for the 30th birthday because I haven't really had a, vaca a real vacation ever since I started working. So I'm like, okay, let's do it. So I bought the ticket for, for Thailand for three months. Yeah, I think it was two days before my my birthday. I flew off to Thailand and I celebrated my birthday in Thailand. So it was it was pretty cool, yeah. And you stayed there for what, three months? Three months, yes. Three months. In, in the camp? Because this is... This is something I think a lot of people are kind of vaguely aware of, the idea of going living at a, a fight camp. What's it like? What's that three months like? It was one of the best times in my life because it was, first of all, I was alone. That was also a good thing because you have to talk to people. You need, to, if you want to socialize or whatever, you, you just need to reach out to people and talk to them. So that was kind of a good experience for me because, I don't know, I was, I was back I wasn't the guy that really was... When I was surrounded by friends, I was full-on entertainer or whatever, you know? But as soon as there was, like, different environment, people that I didn't know, it was just like, okay, I'll just stay somewhere at the at the in the corner and watch, observe, you know? So that's why. That was, that was a good thing, to travel alone. And in the camp, it was... It was just amazing, you know, it's just like I paid my all access plus for the classes, so I did like twice a day we did Muay Thai training and I could if I wanted to, I could attend other classes like, like strength and conditioning classes, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu classes, uh, grappling classes. They had all kinds of stuff there in the gym. But mostly I was doing Muay Thai. So For the uninitiated, what is Muay Thai? Muay Thai is a Thai boxing. Like uh, where you can Use your elbows, knees, kicks, and, uh, you know, like Thai boxing. But it's standing. It's not yes, it's on the standing. ground. No, 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 no. Because it's just standing. If you fall down, you need to stop. If, if the opponent falls down, you need to stop. So it was just only standing. But mostly, for the most part, I did it because of the fitness. I wanted to learn it, but also, like, use it as a, as a fitness tool to be fit or... Cause Boxers are the fittest people. You think they're the fittest athletes maybe on, on earth? They'd have to be up there. It, yeah, definitely. I, somewhere I read that one time that England, uh, some, it was some kind of a study about boxers that they are probably the fittest people. We're talking, when we talk fitness, we're talking the combination of endurance, power, power exactly. endurance. Yeah, it's all, the, the whole package. Definitely they are not as fit for running as an ultra marathon or whatever, you know, so, but the complete package that you are strong, but you have the endurance and like everything, all all fields. What was it like coming back then? You've had three months in Thailand. What was re-entry like? re well, that changed my life quite significantly, the whole thing, because that's where this whole traveling thing started. You know, like I was becoming more and more restless. I was like, okay, you went, you were away for three months and nothing bad really happened. So why not try it again so then I stayed at home for a couple of weeks and I was still thinking oh, should I get a job well I was still managing with the cafe it was okay but all my money was going then to to traveling plans and you know tickets and stuff like that so I never never really got another job so I stick with that so I kept going back and forth traveling for maybe another two years two and a half years that's how I came to Austria then. Tell us that story. Maybe a year after I came back from Thailand, I sold the cafe because I, or it was one and a half years, I'm not really sure, but uh, I sold the cafe because I was tired of going back and forth and stuff. Back then, at that time, I knew I wasn't going to stay in Slovakia. I was just wanted to move somewhere else. Didn't have a plan where or when or how but i just knew i wanted to go away and this was like in 
not a liability, but you had to take care of that of the of the cafe. So it's an anchor, isn't it? Yeah, anchor. Exactly, that's the word. Yeah, anchor. So I wanted to get rid of that. Plus, I didn't have a job, so you know the money was kind of getting tight and stuff. So so I sold it, and I kept on traveling. And kind of that's where the first kind of uh, thoughts came. Oh man, you need to do something because you can't live like this for the rest of your life. You can't just spend money and not make you any money. So. That was that was the thing where where you know sold the cafe, kept on traveling a little bit, but it wasn't freedom wasn't there anymore because in the back of my head I knew, oh man, this is you know you need to figure out something you know. <laughs> so then through coincidence I I got to know friend I, I knew who she was from my hometown, but we met at a biking trip, and we were talking and she said to me because I was telling her my plans that I was doing a road trip to Switzerland in my car and and that I wanted to visit Austria as well. And she told me that she had an apartment in Tel Amze. And if I want, I could stay there. Because was... Tel Amze is not far from Innsbruck, no, right? It's like maybe two, two and a half hours. So, so I immediately got interested in that. I'm like, mm, okay, that's a good idea. And, uh, and I thought about it for a while and I thought, okay, let's do it. So it, back then it was summer. So I... So we made a deal that I rent the apartment for two, three months. And I would go down there to Tel Amze, stay there by myself. And I told myself I will use that time to figure out what I'm going to do next. So I went to Austria, to Tel Amze, stayed there and was just basically training, running and sitting on a balcony for hours drinking coffee and <laughs> thinking about what I'm going to do, you know. And as the time went by, I was like, okay, this is not a place, not a bad place, Austria, actually, because it's not far away from my home country, you know, you just get in your car and in a couple hours you're at home. I like the place, the mountains and stuff, so so it was like, kind of like, okay, this is probably not a bad place to stay. So I started sending out CVs to companies, maybe, you know, find a job. The only company that responded or wrote me back was Booking.com, and... They offered me a job in Kitzbühel, which was, which was 45 minutes from Tel Amze, from the place where I was staying. I'm like, okay, this is nice. So I went through maybe three or four rounds, interviews and stuff, and eventually I got the job. So that was, that was, it was kind of, I don't want to say lucky, but you know, it was cool because all all the people from Slovakia or Czech Republic or Poland or whatever I know they get all these jobs in in uh, services and I didn't really want to do that. So that was cool, but it really helped that I speak spoke German. So then I got the job, moved from Celamze to Kitzbühel, and that's how I got here into Austria. So when you're in Kitzbühel. I have a friend who works for Booking.com. That office closed, didn't it? Did they move you up yeah. to Innsbruck? Yeah, exactly. That was uh, so. I was offered. I actually applied for Innsbruck, but they told me they had an open spot in Kitzbühel, and it, to me, it didn't really matter where I would land. You know, it was just like, okay, I like the place. I just pack my things and move wherever. You know, and I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't a skier back then, or I, I, I'm not a skier now. So. <laughs> so. Uh, and I didn't know what Kidsville was, because Kidsville is this this celebrity spot, you know, where all those all those like I don't, you know show offs go. But you know, <laughs> it's one of the glitzy resorts in the Alps. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I didn't know what it was, what what Kidsville meant, and uh, so I googled that, and I'm like, oh, eight thousand people living in the Kidsville. Whoa, this is kind of this is smaller than my hometown, man. Where I'm going, but. It turned out really good. I I really love Kidsville. It was it was such a great year. But I learned to snowboard there. It, that was that was because I always kind of had this in my head. It was like, hey, you're this super sporty guy, and you never skied in your life. You never did snowboard or whatever. So I'm like, okay, this is the right place to learn one of those things. So the plan was the first winter I would learn to snowboard, and the second winter I would learn to ski. But never really made it to the second winter because we closed that uh, office in Kitzbühel 
and merged it with the office in Innsbruck. So I had to move to Innsbruck and yeah, that's how I landed here. And then from working at booking.com, you now appear to have a yeah, gym. Exactly, because that was still in my head, the own gym, own gym. And uh, well, after a couple of months, uh, I left that job and wanted to start this. You know, this was just because uh, I every the first time I saw this 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 those these arches where my gym is. Yeah, we should explain actually. Yeah. Your gym sits in what they call the Bogans in Innsbruck. It's yeah. railway arches. How many are there? There must be I think hundreds. It's like 160, I think is. Okay, they stretch for a long way. Yeah, it's like two and a half kilometers, I think. So you knew that you wanted your gym, if you were going to open one, you knew you wanted it in here. Yeah. But they can't come up very often. No, this was just, uh, I don't know, somehow, it, this happened to me several times in my life. I just, I, somehow I had this idea that I would, on the weekends, I would just walk past all these arches and just like look inside I don't know what I was hoping. I was just like, maybe somebody comes out, I, I get to talk to them, or I just come, go into the shop and ask people, hey, do you know anybody who, would, who wants to move out out of these or whatever? And one day, I think it was the third or fourth weekend, I don't know, I, I noticed one bogan, one arch. It's arch in English. In English. Arch, yeah. Yeah. One arch in English was uh, like covered with paper, and it was just a number, like a telephone number, and I noticed that they moved. So I called the number and uh, asked if they, when they, yeah, since they moved, if they want to somehow pass it along or, or get rid of the Bowden. And they said, no, no, we want to keep it, but, but they know somebody. I'm like, oh, okay, nice. So could you give me his, his phone number? Yeah, sure. So he sent me his phone number, called that number immediately. So I met with the guy the next day in his Bowden here and I stepped in and I'm like okay this is nice so it was just just perfect for me so we made a deal and that's how it came to the gym I think you're being slightly modest here because there's a lot of people that would like a gym or would like to achieve something but they don't spend the weekends walking up and down this two and a half kilometers of railway arches just in the hope that something comes <laughs> off there's there's, a, there's yeah there's a bit of luck there but there's an awful lot of yeah, yeah not luck yeah Exactly. That's what I was. I'm pretty active on the social media, and that's a couple couple days back, or maybe a week back. I wrote something about luck and meeting your luck halfway, and uh, you can't just sit at home, work, kind of waiting for something to happen, or what. You just need to do something, and it will work out if you put in somehow the the effort and work. Then, you know, at least you tried if nothing else, you know. I think action has a power all of its own. Definitely. And yeah. I know when I started this podcast, you make a website, you get an Instagram account, you buy some equipment and watch some YouTube tutorials about how it works, and suddenly you have a podcast. You haven't actually spoken to anyone yeah, exactly. at this stage. <laughs> but the action... I know, I know what you mean. It, it creates momentum. Yeah, exactly. It creates momentum and motivation. So you keep on going because it drives you. But... There needs to be, I think there needs to be a certain level of passion in it because uh, that's what I keep saying, leave your passions because that was my whole philosophy, I think, the whole thing, all my jobs and stuff, I kind of saw them always as stepping stones somehow to get to or get the money for something or I don't know, whatever, just somehow work, work and have a goal of doing this or that and gym was, as well, having my own gym was a really big dream of mine. There's that famous Gary Player quote that the more you practice, the luckier you get. Uh, and it's true. And there is an element of luck. And we've spoken to people who are involved in extreme sports. And there is an element of luck in survival or not survival. There's an element of luck in all things in life. But the old thing that you make your own luck, it's so true, isn't it? There's oh, an yeah, element definitely. of pure luck, but there's also an element of creating the opportunity for the luck. Yes, definitely. You need to be active. You just need to do something. If you if you kind of like passively wait for something, uh, it's not going to work out. You just and uh, you also. I think you need to find your. You need to know what your passion is, and because uh, some people already there have a problem. They don't know what their what their passion is. 
that's that's probably a big bigger problem than somehow you know like making it work so we we talked about how action leads to more action and momentum and the interesting aspect about your gym here in Innsbruck is you hadn't been here long. You didn't know many people. You didn't have a list of private clients ready to start coming. Exactly. Oh, yeah. That was that that was a big risk because, yeah, like you said, I didn't know anybody here. It was just I was completely new here. But, you know, time is running and you were not getting any younger. So I'm like, I'm thinking, oh, man, if I'm not going to do it now, when then you know i can't open up a gym as a 50 year old that would be kind of ridiculous i think uh, and certainly not this type of gym so so i said to myself now nah, i'm gonna do it i kind of was convinced about the whole idea about the whole how i wanted to be the gym and i knew it would work because it was my passion. I knew what I was doing because that was probably the only thing, or not the only thing, but it was one of the things where I was certain what I was doing and I knew, also had the passion for it, the drive. So it would kind of, because I think passion is attractive, attracts people because when they see, okay, first of all, you need to know what you're doing, but but still, if you if you have those two, you know what you're doing and it is your passion, you halfway there more than halfway there you know what i mean so my first clients or my the first people that were training here were my ex colleagues from my from my job here so and then it somehow slowly spread word of mouth kind of thing because i i haven't had the money for like doing big marketings and web campaigns or whatever so it was just you just need to stay patient and kind of calculate the time in because I also opened up the gym just before summer, which is, I think, not really a good time to open up a gym, you know, because everybody wants to spend the time outdoors and then you say, hey, come inside. So, yeah, but still, I kind of, I wanted to do it and I was, there was certainly a, some some level of risk in it, but I I kind of knew it would work, so. You're realistic about the whole thing though, right? I mean, you just said it's, it opened at the start of summer. So what were your realistic hopes for that first year? Yeah, exactly, a year. That was my hope that I would give myself a year and we'll see how it goes. Because I know somebody told me back then when I was starting, like the the Tyrolians are uh, kind of tough people to convince about something. So I knew, okay, this is going to take a while. Although probably I have lots of people from different countries here in the gym. So that's... Uh, not many real Tyrolians train here. I think it's like 50% maybe. And the other 50, the other half is like all over the place. You know, all those flags that are hanging up here, those are the countries that people come from that train here. One thing that's immediately obvious when you watch what happens here is that you've created a community. Again, I'm interested how much of this is luck and how much of it is your work, but it seems like you only have people training here that you want to train here. <laughs> yeah, that was that was the that was the plan from the beginning. Pro it was probably luck also because everybody that comes in here through the door is uh, it's just cool people here. I don't know, never really had a problem like somebody not somehow fitting in or causing problems or whatever. It's just like, you know, but I still told myself if there would be somebody, I don't know, that I wouldn't like, I don't know how to say it. But uh, somebody that didn't fit in. Yeah, somebody that didn't fit in. I would probably, let's put it that way. I would probably choose the people that would train here. So the other people that are already here feel good, like like it's some some sort of a family feeling, you know. Like that's an interesting balance you have to find, though, isn't it? Between you have financial reality of rent, <laughs> exactly, and buying equipment and paying your rent to live in a nice apartment, but then. The culture is what attracts people. Yeah. I'm interested in your take on that balance between needing to make money but also needing to preserve your culture. Well, to be honest, it wasn't that hard to, to preserve the culture because, like I said, there isn't one single person in this gym that I don't like. Or, you know, uh, I'm a nice guy as well. So, <laughs> so obviously they all like you. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. So, 
Yeah, it was. Uh, that this was my. This was part of the whole idea, the whole concept that it should be a fun place, you know, like to hang out after the session, stay here. That's why these couches are here. Just you know, stay here, talk whenever you want, whatever you want. You know, just you know. It wasn't just like this. This big global gyms where you just come in, you just a number and you punch out and you go out. You know, that's not what I wanted to have. You know. If people happen to find themselves in this part of the world and they want to come and train here, what is the training? CrossFit based, or t- take some things from CrossFit because you are a yeah. certified CrossFit instructor. Yes, that was that as well. Oof. We mentioned that before with the whole CrossFit thing that I was a big, big fan. I still am, but uh, I kind of deviated from that for a while. Oh, for a while, uh, I deviated from that because. I just took some elements from it and used it in my kind of training, my style of training. I used elements from Thai boxing, used elements from weightlifting, elements from bodybuilding or equipment wise, also used different kinds of equipments for certain things. Just, I don't kind of like this, this, I think Japanese have this philosophy about taking the best out of everything out and uh, use it, you know, combine it. Just look at a. I think it was Japanese, right? I don't know. I'm not sure. It was somewhere. I'm nodding along. I don't know. I, uh, I think. <laughs> I think I read something about their culture that they were like learning from other cultures and just taking stuff out that they thought was good, you know, and then apply it. So that's how I saw my training. I didn't want to be stuck in like uh, just one thing studio, you know, just like you know be open-minded just use everything or your judgment your experience and combine it into something that makes sense from the training point of view and one interesting thing is just before we started recording i said it looks like you've achieved the dream you're living the dream you've made it and yet it seems like this might not be the end goal after all (laughs) after all those years of dreaming of having your own gym yeah exactly exactly this is uh, i'm reading a book right now uh from Mark Manson, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on this, but you know, it's just I've just, got a beat machine. Okay, it's called the subtle art of not giving a fuck. So that's 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 what I actually read this page yesterday because he said there's something about like people are wired to be dissatisfied. You know, it's always this this thing like the grass is greener on the other side. I think that's what it is. You know, once you achieve something somehow you want to move on, you want something else. This is just how the brain works. That's what I read there. So, And I think also, I think I started this gym too late. Not, not too late, but a couple years too late. For the CrossFit boom or for your life, you mean? For my life, I think. Because, yeah, the CrossFit boom, there was another thing because uh, as soon as I found out about CrossFit back then in Bratislava, in my home, t- um, in, my, in Slovakia, I... Always was thinking, oh, maybe I should open up a box. That's what they call the gym, a box, not a gym. So I was like, oh, maybe. But I kind of misjudged the Slovak people back then because I, I, was, I thought nobody would want to go into a garage and do squats somewhere on the street or whatever because it was just like, I thought it was this American mentality that they are more open-minded to stuff like that. And I kind of misjudged that because couple years later the big boom came and uh you know all of a sudden there was lots of crossfit studios all over the place and i'm like oh okay maybe i should have done that (laughs) but yeah it was it was okay because uh uh i think right when i look back i'm happy i have the gym here in austria and not at home so it's just worked out fine so what is the plan next few years next few years i you know the plan is well, as we mentioned, uh, it's. I thought kind of. I started thinking that I should have opened up this place r- a bit sooner. You know, have the courage, the balls to do it. You know, uh, but I was just. You know, I think I was thinking too long, like str- strategizing or whatever. And I was also this thing, this whole thing with with traveling. I was kind of like finding my place. I didn't know where I'm going to settle down. And it was just kind of like these dark times where I was almost fell into depressions or whatever. The time in, in the, the 
couple to two three months in in Selamze in that department that was just like you know like oh man this is not going well you know <laughs> somehow although everything worked out fine you know i i was traveling i was doing this and this and yet somehow i just felt wow oh, man something's not right you know i think it was the age i felt i was getting older and you're know, like wow well, you know now it's the time to kind of settle down maybe and do something like build something i don't know so that's the plan now the plan is okay sorry <laughs> yeah <laughs> the plan is well to keep on with the gym because this was it was just uh such 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 a big dream for me um not getting rid of it definitely not but there is all all sorts of other things that are coming that i would like to do and that uh that i'm developing a passion for so it wouldn't be it probably won't be the only thing to do the gym i mean because first of all it's also one thing i learned from experience again that you should do more things you know you should not rely on one thing because if that thing fails you're done and also i at, at my first job although it helped me to get the money for the cafe it was still i think i spent too much time in there i was too long in the job because i kind of fell asleep i call it just got comfortable and uh comfort zone is dangerous you know if you if you're there you just yeah i'm comfortable but all of a sudden five years later you wake up I'm like oh okay but now you know i want to do something and then you just think okay i lost a couple of years so you know you just have one life so got to do something with it <laughs> That is a perfect summary, it would seem, of your philosophy. Yeah. Pete, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Thank you for hey, thank taking the time. Hey, thanks for having me, man. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, good luck with the gym. And something tells me we're going to hear about you in <laughs> other things as well. Maybe, maybe. Hey, thanks, man. Yeah, no worries, man. Thank you. So a huge thank you to Petter for his time and inspiration. If you want to learn more about him check out hybridfitness.at it will help if you can speak German and follow him on Instagram for English and German posts at hybrid underscore fitness underscore Austria if you've enjoyed the show today and want to hear more from the winning mentality don't forget to subscribe share comment leave reviews tell us what you think and tell your friends to listen in too we'll see you next week